long before the public saw through the stainless steel charade. With the engine in the back, there was indeed room for a set of golf clubs, but other more important design details had escaped DeLorean's attention. The burnished steel showed up fingerprints like a mirror, and worse, the standard Renault alternator was too weak to cope with the demands of the electronics and air conditioning, flattening the battery in days. So if you popped the electronic locks from the inside, you could literally lock yourself in until someone came to prize you out. Mr. DeLorean was in fact trapped in the car on one occasion. Um, as these things happen, it couldn't happen to a nice chap. Uh, the, uh, the door locks failed at the critical time. He was at a reception in London and he just couldn't get out. But uh, it was sorted in due course, but uh, it certainly got things going at the factory. Sadly, it was too late. By the end of its first year, only 4,500 cars had found owners. But DeLorean needed more money and planned to float shares in his American parent firm. He needed his company to look busy and successful, so he actually stepped up production, putting raw recruits straight onto the line. Belfast was making cars no one wanted and hemorrhaging a fortune. Endlessly optimistic, DeLorean went to London to ask for yet more cash. But there'd been a seismic shift in the political landscape. Subsidies were out of fashion, and the iron hairdo was not for turning. It's a crime. DeLorean's luck finally ran out when he was accused of brokering a multi-million dollar cocaine deal. Between this and the other, it'll generate uh, about four and a half, uh, not less than four and a half, no. The feds had filmed the whole thing. DeLorean was going down. Or he would have been if the judge hadn't accused the FBI of entrapment. DeLorean was acquitted, but even he had to admit that his reputation was in tatters. I don't know, would you buy a used car from me? <laughs> but the joke came as cold comfort for the 2,600 workers in Belfast. The factory was closed and the cars and equipment auctioned off for whatever they'd fetch. The feeling on the line during the last days of DeLorean was almost a desperation. There was a lot of resignation. I felt terribly sorry for everybody on the track there. They'd worked their guts out for the company. They'd come into the company knowing that it was the first job they'd had for years and years. They wondered why so many staff were being taken on and not being trained in the proper manner. And they became sort of resigned to the thought that they would earn as much money as they could while it lasted. So it was a terrible thing, really depressing. So exactly how much money went into the project and where did it go? Well, the absurdity is, to this day, nobody is exactly sure. All we know is that the British government gambled 85 million pounds. US investors bet another 8 million and US dealers threw in three and a half. But when DeLorean was busted by the FBI, all that was left was a mere couple of hundred grand. It's a gas. In 1984, a British government report concluded that over $17 million had disappeared without trace, and it was one of the worst abuses of taxpayers' money ever. But there are still those who insist that John DeLorean was a mere victim of circumstance, or worse. I understand that there are still a body of people, probably most of them owners of DeLorean automobiles, who think that it was a visionary car, who think that there was a conspiracy to stop it, who think that th there were darker forces that force this brilliant man out of business and to them I simply say nonsense you know there are probably a handful of people somewhere who still think the world is flat given all the obstacles it's a miracle that the DMC was ever built at all and that helps the mystique maybe that's why a man with a Ferrari and a Maserati has found space for one in his collection You've got to be a certain amount of an extrovert and a little bit egotistical when you drive one of these because without doubt everybody sort of has. You can't, you cannot be hidden in this, you know, wherever you go someone's going to be saying, hello, what the hell's that? Is it a Lotus? Is it a Lamborghini? What the heck is it? 
And then, of course, you can see them say, it's a DeLorean. And I think that's the excitement of it. It is just so rare. To be quite honest, if I had to, for financial reasons, sell one of the three, the DeLorean would be the one to go. Although, of course, it wouldn't raise anything like the money of the other two. But it will always be a very well-recognized piece of motoring history, I think, for many years to come. No doubt much aided by the uh, Back to the Future films. The Back to the Future trilogy did indeed immortalize the car that John built. I'm going to take a little joy ride. It would have been the greatest plug in auto history. I'll still a bye bye. But it was all too late in the day. Universal Studios even opened a Back to the Future ride in Florida with, yep, you guessed it, 24 DeLorean replicas. Let's hope they're better made than the originals. The spectre of his ill-fated enterprise continues to haunt John DeLorean. He's just filed for bankruptcy and there's still a warrant out for his arrest in the UK. You'd think it was time for Johnny to quit the car business. Well, you'd be wrong. At this point in time, I'm doing a new project. I've got the financing in place to do another car project. And I'm doing it in a different way. I'm only, the only thing I've asked is I don't want any profit from it. I want it all to go to certain charities. But in the meantime, I'm insisting that people who invested in with me and believe in me are going to be repaid two for one on their investment. Looks like we haven't heard the last of Mr. John Zachary DeLoria. You have to admit, it is an incredible story. It would make a fantastic TV movie. There's just one tiny problem. Nobody would ever believe it. No more heroes anymore. No more heroes.